USNG implementation work group meeting of January 24th, 2024. Um, the structure for what we'll do today in this hour is we'll do a half an hour of administrative meeting and updates. Then uh, the last uh, 28 minutes or so, uh, Fennis Reed uh, from California. Uh, help me out, Fennis. I know you're out there. Uh, economic geography. Department of Finance. Demographics. Yeah. <laughs> it's, close. Ter it's terrible. These old people running meetings and they can't remember anything. Okay, uh, we'll be doing a discussion on the U.S. Census Bureau graded census data plan, and then uh, two minutes for me to blab here at the end. Um, administrative means and updates. I'm just going to blow through this stuff. Here we go. Um, well, let's see a roll call. Uh, have been automatically uh, collected off of Zoom. The recorder is up and running, and I floated out to the floor. Um, I'm calling the meeting to order and. Do I have someone to second that? Second. Anybody opposed? Hearing none, our meeting is underway. Are there any changes to the agenda? Going once, going twice, gone. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Appreciate you taking time out of your day. Um, we more or less walked through the first time attendees. Um, I believe unless I miss somebody, and if I did, uh, please speak up now or forever hold your peace. Going once, going twice, gone. Okay, thank you. We're underway. Uh, reports. Um, the board of directors last met on December 12th, and I'm very pleased to announce that I believe the consensus among the group is We've achieved what they call in the emergency response world or Department of Defense a battle rhythm where we feel like we're in sync and we're starting to make things move forward. Um, the schedule, in case you're unaware of it, uh, the Board of Directors meets in the last month of every quarter. And this uh, esteemed group from across the nation meets the first month of every quarter. Uh, the BOD, the Board of Directors initiated numerous changes, and I'm going to brief those that follow in the old business and issues section. So that's coming up. Uh, the secretary report would be, Randy, or do you want to chime in or I'll just read them? Oh, go ahead. I have nothing else to add to okay. what you have here on the slide. Yep. Yeah, so posted here, uh, pull out your pencil and pen or whatever it is in this day and age uh, and scribble down the next time the board's going to meet will be March 12th at 11 a.m. Um, you're welcome to come sit in on the board if you'd like to do that to come to understand what we're doing and how we're trying to move things forward. And the next meeting of this group will be on Wednesday, April 24th at 2 p.m. Central Time. Okay, the Treasurer's Report, what B.J. Colstead, who is lounging around outside page arizona would want us to know is that the last meeting balance we were at 559.53 current account balance is 612 dollars and 24 cents um that is because there has been numerous uh inbound domains and other shuffling that's going around that needs to be paid for and so the reminder also here would be this organization has no debt, no outstanding bills. And if you want to help things go forward, there's the link down there. It's on our uh, webpage, be able to donate. And after you donate, you get this nice little form will come back to you saying that you've donated in a way that you can write it off on your taxes if you care to do so. Um, Old business and issues. Before I get wandering down that lane, are there any additional items relative to the report from the board and you know the the corporate officers? Going once, going twice, gone. Okay, old business issues. Well, after beating my head against the wall for an extended period of time, trying to force people to go into committees, it 
came to a realization during the board meeting that, well, we're going to probably have to adopt a different approach to doing what we're doing. So uh, the plan for committees going forward, the, the three that you see there on the screen, which is a snapshot off of the website, there's no deviation from that. Those are standard sort of required things in standard bylaws um, when you incorporate in a state and we would need a board of directors, which we have up and functioning. We would need an executive committee, which is made up of the chair, the secretary and the treasurer. Um, and they serve as the corporate officers to make decisions in between the meetings of the board. So we have that. The only thing we didn't have in place or hadn't really thought about until I went back and dug around in the, the bylaws was the fact that, lo and behold, we're required to have a finance committee. And the reason that got overlooked is because the oversight um, until we become a self-standing nonprofit has been actually delivered by Share Geo. And so I've asked um, Bernard and uh, Cole to step forward on the board of directors to uh, operate as part of the finance committee. And that would be three people. It's the treasurer, as it's indicated there, and two other members of the board. And so they're responsible for the oversight and the ethical responsible management of money of the Institute as it goes forward. Well, you're looking at 600 and some bucks in the, the piggy bank, who really cares? Well, the answer is we're going to need to have money coming in going forward, and we'll be looking at ways to imp to make that happen. And once we kind of click into that mode of operation, having oversight on money is essential operating function of any well-run nonprofit. So that will be something that we're going to be working towards. Um, well, that leaves us with what what do we do with these other four things that we're kind of we were kind of calling committees. Well, the answer is we're going to transition to what we're going to call project teams that operate instead of as, as committees, but operate as literally four functional areas of, of the U.S. National Green Institute. This is for outward promotion to help people understand <clears throat> the sorts of things that we are working on. Well, that's all well and good, but what's the focus of the things that we're working on that fall into one of these four functional areas? Well, here they are. Your board of directors came through and out of that priorities grid we were previously talking about, came to a decision about what they considered to be the most important things for us to work on near term. And the breakdown that you see there on, on the screen um, really amounts to we have a more or less an ad hoc effort going forward. And you can look at the range of things that are being done there, and it becomes pretty apparent that they respectively slot into any one of those four different um, uh, areas that I spoke about earlier, those functional areas. So it'll be an ad hoc effort going forward. The owner, there needs to be an owner for a project to be considered active. So the highlighting on the left side indicates if it's yellow, that only one person is working on a particular item. And you can see right next to um, where it shows the potential projects in this inverse total, the higher your number here, the more important the, the, the item is. Well, the highlighting tells you that it ended up being in the top 10. Because if you, for instance, if we go look at, you know, work with the FCC to incorporate U.S. National Grid as a communication standard, nobody has stepped forward to own that project. So it will not be considered to be a priority. It doesn't make sense to have a project where no one's willing to volunteer and work on and then consider that to be a priority. So we're only going to make the ones that are, are listed here as the top priorities. So some priorities, as it indicates down here, got bypassed for now because of greater priorities. Well, what I mean by that is poor old Swayze guy up here, he's already working on 
the website stuff in the center. So he can't really be down here spending time on these two, although they're very high ranking priorities. So as soon as these items get cleared off above, lo and behold, I'll drop down and work with BJ on the production guide and, and Al with the professional correspondence. So let's go, <laughs> let's go take a look at where we are right now in terms of moving these projects forward by using it in a priorities, uh, in a priorities way. So priorities, number one is websites. And the effort there is to move into ownership of the U.S. National Grid Institute three implementations on the web. There may be some stuff going on in the future. We've talked about this a little bit in the past about maybe there might be some ways to combine, combine elements and whatnot. But um, the intent as they are currently set up is the Institute will be the, the function of promotion and outreach. The U.S. National Grid Information Center will be technical and training items. And then last but not least, the U.S. National Grid store items for sale. So where are we on moving that stuff forward? Well, um, this has taken a back burner because it's, it's largely, if you will, built out on the front site. There are some gaps on it. I, I totally get that. But we have a higher priority and trying to move those other two websites along to get them to where they need to be. So right now, the status, the only thing that has happened with this since the last quarter is um, that the, the committee web page has been updated to reflect what I just briefed. Um, the U.S. National Grid Information Center, two domains have already been transferred. The principal domains have already been transferred over into the U.S. National Grid Institute account, and there are six more in transit. What would those six more in transit be? Well, well uh, please put put your phone on mute if you would. Um, uh, what would be those other six six that are that are in transit? There are things that support like you can actually go U.S. National Grid. Uh, I'm sorry, USNG Center or USNG Info, and you'll pop up on the National Grid uh, Center. So. Uh, the website, if you've been trying to go over there lately, it's down right now. There, there's an easy way to fix that, but we're in the middle of, uh, of bringing it across, and it's just easier for us to leave it down for three or four days to bring it back up over at, at uh, the hosting owned by the Institute. Um, ELMs, items for sales. Um, Share Geo chipped in $2,500, as some of you are aware, to convert from... Um, a big commerce site um, to WordPress and WooCommerce site. And that project's been underway since October. It solves multiple structural issues over at the store, uh, provides a way to update the theme and remain flexible. And largely the transition work is done and I'm simply going through right now, editing pages and layout, and it will go live uh, at usngstore.org uh, domain since it belongs to a non what will be a nonprofit. And again, we've got multiple domains there that will point at that location. Well, if, if you just pause for a minute and remember what the store used to look like, it was, a, a, it was chaos as to where stuff had been uh, placed up on the website um, because it was just built over time and it was on this old implementation. Well, what we're going to do is, on this conversion piece, we're going to go from a 10-year-old limited sales site into something basically that's going to support um, a more dynamic approach. For instance, the, the stale kind of, you know, store terms and conditions, you know, they're going to be parked up here along the top. But as you can see here, what this is going to be about is walking people through the process of understanding how you go about developing an ELM project, how you go about thinking about who's out there that might support it. So for instance, in about ELMs, you can see what would be listed there. Under the under project development, we developed at ShareGeo a really slick uh, project estimator and that that's never been made public. And as soon as we can figure out how to transition it completely, 
you know, you just plug in the length of trail that you want to put in was in a rural or, or uh, um, urban setting, and it will estimate everything down to bolts, um, anything you might need to have done for that particular project. And then we've been honored by a number of, of individuals across the year that have come forward and made the effort. You know, I, I know, for instance, Jesse is Jesse Glasgow is on this call. He's an installer. He's a consultant um, and has done a lot of work. In, and we want to be able to highlight those kinds of people and their efforts um, so that other people are aware of them being out there. Then we'll, uh, under the ELM thing, we'll offer stuff that's directly related to ELMS. And then last but not least, we'll have promotional items. Um, and again, on the old site, a lot of that stuff was just all mixed together and you couldn't follow what was what. So we're going to move on to a modern how-to WooCommerce enabled website is where that one's going. Priority two uh, is this map, map book uploader. Uh, it's a link uh, enablement capability. Uh, we've got we're doing some research hosting on that. And as soon as we've got that figured out, uh, we'll get on that as soon as our de developer comes back. She's on vacation right now down in Columbia. Um, Elm Production Guide, as I indicated earlier, that's on hold until the websites are operational. And our standard correspondence, I just slapped one up here from Share Geo to give the idea of what we'll want to move towards in terms of having documentation going forward that presents our our efforts as being done professionally um big shout out down to florida state university um and if you're not aware of it uh, for priorities five eight and ten it all amounts to getting social media enabled um getting uh, a more dynamic approach to getting the word out about our efforts and starting on the 15th of january Florida State University has in place um, a full, well, I don't, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got basically an, brought on an intern. I was going to say full time, but I know better than that. Um, and they're going to be dedicated to Florida State had already laid out project outline for different things that this intern could be working on in support of U.S. National Grid. And they've already developed a social media campaign document which is way above and beyond. So very, very cool. Hats off to Florida State University. Priority uh, number six was a generic U.S. National Grid trifold. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, took the lead on this. And uh, since we last met, put together a very nice document. And uh, we're to the point where the trifold is uh, ready to go down for um, art fine tuning because there's some bugs in how it was laid out and, and whatnot. And uh, we've received a couple of pages worth of recommendations on how to fine tune some stuff. And we'll be looking at that. Uh, what do we do? What do we miss here? Number seven, uh, the USNG app.org slash beta has been the original pain in the patootie uh, as far as getting the thing back up and running. Uh, there's a long history of technical things that went on, both at, you know, web enablement and what went on in the Google and the Apple stores. And we finally technically been able to work around all that. And the big hang up for literally like the last year has been implementing a legal agreement because we're now in that world where even something this simple, because there's going to be a cookie involved in it. We went from basically two paragraphs of being the license has now become six pages of you can read it at your leisure if you're out camping and have nothing better to do. But uh, that's the reason that has been uh, held up. So just completed testing. There's a number of changes have been requested. And uh, once we get there, the old app's going to be deprecated. And we're also going to pull the stuff down from Google and Apple stores because quite frankly, they haven't been playing nice. Uh, priority number nine is USNG map book production guides. Uh, Share Geo, the current um, uh, geospatial information officer of the state of Minnesota, created these a long time ago, back in 2016 now. Randy Knippel did an, up, an interim update from these, and he's planning on, because of 
the way a number of things have moved along and Esri uh, been, uh, is getting ready to um, uh, do an update on that. And he's looking at the calendar and when he retires and he goes, and I got to get this done before I leave here in May. So keep your fingers, keep your fingers crossed on that one. Uh, yeah, did I miss 10? Okay. Uh, we got a couple of more issues. If I could learn how to click. Okay, <clears throat> we've been working on get putting training wheels on the board of directors. Um, so this is, a, you know, you just don't start from scratch and everything works perfectly. So we've been working towards building a process to create an engaged board. Um, the board has decided that rather than always being an odd number, they're going to be flexible if someone needs to leave the board. There's a 75% rule on unexcused absences. you got to make 75% of the meetings. And uh, nominations for real will open in October. We did a, if you will, a test drill this past year, and there's stuff that was learned from that. And uh, we elect people for three-year terms. Mary Susan uh, has asked to step down. She represented the state of New York, um, and we're sad to see her go because she's got a wealth of background information, but she's currently dealing with a, a family health issue. Um, so Randy Knipple and Al were uh re-upped for another three years and the board decided that mysterian was somebody that we didn't want to have on the board so there you go that's where we are on on running through the board process of of the cycle of refreshment if you will uh meeting communications the board beat me up said hey you got to do a better job in getting out the word so they the suggested approach would be to send out a mail chip thir, chimp 30 days beforehand, an email approximately 10, and then another meet. I can't say it. A meal chimp? No, how about a mail chimp? A mail chimp reminder one day before. Um, these tend to get filtered differently as they come into the various barracuda and whatnot. So that's the reason for the different kinds of approaches. And a big, big foot stomper, if you would, please. Please forward, when you see one of these things, if there's somebody you know that might be interested in finding out what we're up to and what's going on, please be sure to forward those. Um, that would be much appreciated. Um, ELM Promotion, uh, Sustainable Trails Conference. Uh, big shout out to Jennifer Lana and Dave Ablashi. Uh, they are uh, pressing forward with doing a presentation at that event. And past history suggests that if you're going to do a presentation at one of these events, it'd be a good idea to have a booth. And since ELMs have tended to be something that has gotten our foot in the door in a number of places, um, I am going to do everything in my power to get a new backstop made and head south to get a little relief from winter. Um, again, past history for some folks, our storage locker got broken into and for the, for, for the use of a plastic case, a thousand dollar backdrop got thrown in the trash and they also walked off with our flyer stands, TV, TV stand, you know, as I've already indicated the backdrop. And lo and behold, I call up the backdrop company and what do they tell me? Oh, the file's already long gone because it's more than three years old. So I'm going to need to rebuild it from scratch. And that could be an interesting evolution. So all told, we're probably out about 1800 bucks. Got to figure out when I say we, poor old share geo is probably out around 1800 bucks. I got to do some arm twisting to see if I can uh, make something happen to get this fixed but I need to get it into production fairly soon here. So anyway, that's what's going on with that. Okay, so here's an 18 month review. Here's what we completed. Got a functioning board of directors, quarterly large group meetings have been resumed and we're on schedule. There's a nationwide database has been created and we got the ability to take donations. What's being worked right now, we got multiple cleanup projects underway as I just briefed. We got other fine tuning that needs to be done till we can call ourselves a truly functioning organization administratively and operationally. And we're still kind of working towards a consistent look and feel for how we do stuff, professionalization. What's the future hold? 
Um, I'm convinced by mid-year of, uh, of 2024, this kind of, you know, backdrop stuff is going to be taken care of and our efforts can fully focus on, as I've described it, becoming a beacon of encouragement for implementation, outreach, technical support, and training. Okay. All right. The classic question is, with all this stuff going on, how can you contribute? Well, here, if you want to be a passive actor, it's a classic thing if you're in a trench fighting. If you don't want to be one of the people up there standing along the edge of the trench sending rounds downrange, at least pass the ammunition. So that's, please think about donating. Sign up as a U.S. National Grid U, uh, M, uh, Institution YouTube subscriber. You know, let's build out the community. Sign up for social media accounts as Florida State University brings that stuff online. Please think about forwarding meeting announcements. It's a very easy, simple thing to do. You got a couple of people in your contact box, send it along. Read up on U.S. National Grid so you can help others understand the importance. And if you know about a grant or a potential other funding source, please, please let me know. I've written a ton of them, but the trick is you got to know what's out there. And, you know, within the group and the radar that's turned on, if you become aware of something, please, by all means, let me know. Okay, volunteer to work uh, active. You want to volunteer to work on a project or become a project owner? Great. You got talent? Please let me know. For example, videographer, you know, graphic artist, grant writer head of a dance troupe, I don't care. You got some specialized kind of, you know, talent. We might be able to figure out how to do like a video of dancing actors singing about U.S. National Grid. Who knows? And give a Zoom training event. There I am right there. You can contact me 24-7. I got nothing better to do than to try to push this rope up a hill in the rain, as Al Stuck would say. Okay. All right, how can you contribute? Well, if you don't want to send me an email, reminder, on our website, there's the volunteer thing, and it clicks open, and there's a module in there. Okay, who or what did I miss? Going once. <laughs> Going twice. I actually came up for every, everybody. All right, okay, here we go. There's the new business. Anybody got any new business? Because I do. And we got to whip through this because I want to make sure Fennis has got enough time. Here they are. Socialization, marketing, and videos. I'm already kicking around with Mike Core the idea of what do we need to do to position ourselves for being able to, because what we need to do here is market. Market, market, market U.S. National Grid. And to me, that breaks down in the video world, 60-second sell promo kind of thing, testimonials and interviews, instructional videos, and then webinars. And yeah, I know everybody knows how to do Zoom, but on the backside, there needs to often be some editing needs to be done. So what's needed? Out of the gate, this needs to be done professionally. Scripts, shot plan, et cetera. We got enough junk stuff out there. Let's make sure that going forward, whatever we produce has got enough zing to it with a U.S. National Grid Institute label on it. People go, oh, maybe I ought to look at that. Paid videographers are available. Both Florida State and myself are looking at a situation where we may have somebody that potentially works cheap, but we'll still need cash from somewhere to make things happen. And that goes kind of goes back to the grant thing. All right. Well, one last thought. Another way to raise money is to sell stuff through the store. Now, I know you're laughing at swag, but somebody out there's probably got a very inventive mind, like T-shirts that say Got Grid or coffee cups with U.S. National Grid seals on it, that kind of stuff. And a place like Zazzle, we can set up an account. It can be completely drop shipped off of that store function that I talked about earlier, where lo and behold, you don't do anything other than collect money. So it's just gonna take some artistic effort to get some things up there that people will start looking at and thinking about buying. 
Okay. Comments, announcements, other business. Going once. Going twice. Sorry, Fantas, I'm bad. I burned five minutes of your time. Hey, this is Jen. I just wanted to know that I'm still... I have a conflict for that presentation that in um, Georgia for the Trailbuilders Conference. I know Dave Ablashi has signed up to go. Um, I think Todd Sanders, one of our fire um, personnel, may be able to go as well. Um, I apologize. I was, I'm not really sure if I'm going to be able to make it or not yet, but I'll keep you posted, Steve. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jen. Thank you so much for giving me a heads up. Yeah. 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 Somebody will be there to present, though. No worries. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'm it. just not sure I may have a conflict that day, so I'm not sure if I'll be able to make it up there. Well, my plan is to, after I get done there, wander up up the coast and go knock on some doors in D.C. anyway. So. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, Fennis, are, are you ready to take over this heated discussion? Sure. Very, very happily here. Um Okay, so before you get going, let me show you what I got. I got three slides that I put in here for you. You okay. know, just one was, and I've got available if you need to go over to the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau's full PowerPoint. I got that queued up if you want to use that too. But and then I just took and split the the um, document you sent out. Okay. Well, I, I think we could probably just stick with the document to this. Um, okay. I feel like a lot of the original census presentation was very speculative. Um, and this will be a little more focused. Okay. You got it. Sweet. All right. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, the U.S. Census Bureau is starting to put out some feelers for this idea of distributing census data uh, in a gridded format. Um, so they proposed a few different ways that they could do that, uh, including various vector and raster based services. Obviously, we're talking about an incredibly large amount of area that would need to be covered through some sort of gridded service. And so I think this places uh, the US national grid in a very strong position to uh, create a, a really, I think, a impactful case uh, for why, why we could be an ideal solution here. Uh, so the, the real goal here is that they will be able to increase availability of census data for uh, relatively small jurisdictions. As I'm sure many of you all are aware with the uh, 2020 census, there were a lot of concerns around differential privacy, which directly impacts the uh, reliability of a lot of the data at very finite scales. So the hope is that by distributing data in a more uniform way, uh, there might be able to be a new level of detail gleaned for some of these smaller jurisdictions. Uh, so big, big things to take away here about the product as a whole. The idea is that this would then be something that is slated uh, in addition to existing census products. So this would not end up replacing uh, uh, existing census geographies, block, block routes, tracts, things like that. Um, but would purely be <laughs> in an enrichment format. Um, while this is in the earliest stages of feedback collection, it does sound like uh, this is at the soonest would be implemented during the 2030 census. Um, I think that may even be ambitious. I think we're all a little bit familiar with how slow things can go at the census side of things. Um, but that said, <laughs> it's a great time for us to get in our two cents on why the USNG would be a, a good thing to include. Uh, so the big assumption that we're going to be working with for this discussion uh, is that we are a, focused on preparing a response. So I wanna be able to hear from as many people as we possibly can about how the US national grid is currently being used or how uh, it could be used in conjunction with census data to enrich your current workflows and services. Uh, but we're all always going to be sort of uh, coming back from the standpoint of the US national grid as the desirable end service. So even if you feel like, oh, maybe my um, particular case or particular use would be better suited by a vector or uh, some other like unique raster uh, format. Um, there is the email that's included in <laughs> at the very, very base here, both my email, penis.read, and then also at the top of the PDF that was sent out in the invite, uh, if you want to be able to submit your own submission, uh, regardless of the US national grid. Um, yes, right there, geo.grids. <laughs> Yeah. 
So uh, first sort of point of discussion that I want to pose to the group uh, is what is your agency currently using the U.S. national grid uh, for uh, in the scope of what could be enriched with census data? Uh, and is that data then serviced internally or externally uh, to your organization? Would anyone like to start us off or I can I can give some examples of what that's like uh, for our organization out here. Uh. Venice. Yes. I I think we're wandering into the realm of the the survey that was done by the US Fire Service or administration when they asked how many fire stations in 2013 were using the U.S. National Grid for anything, and mm -hmm. the answer came back just under 3%. So it probably would be a better approach to do what you were talking about doing. Why don't you talk a little bit about conceptually some different ways that that can be tackled? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for... Our biggest use case, we're concerned with distributing demographic and population and housing information uh, to any number of really unique jurisdictions throughout the state of California. And so more often than not, uh, a lot of our jurisdictions are ill represented by existing city, county and other census geographies. So we need to have good ways of being able to map and distribute information at very finite scales. So the U.S. National Grid is a really big boon for us to be able to distribute information using because it allows us to really get down and get a little bit nitpicky with how we're distributing our data. Uh, so this is an instance where our use case is primarily external. Uh, we're distributing this data to other people. Um, and at the same time, it is directly reliant on census data when we are producing a lot of our estimates. So if we already know that, you know, we have data being delivered to us at a census uh, official, like USNG scale, and that's just going to be that much more interoperable with our current data. It's too bad Talbot's not on the on the call because he's got a lot of Dr. Clark's stuff just on the top of his head um, in terms of uh, the different ways that have been put forward to be able to use U.S. National Grid for um, exactly what you're talking about of course the florida team um has long been a proponent of of um, how to sanitize data uh using you know national grid but jennifer had put something in the chat do you want to follow up with that hey i just put in the link in case you for those that don't have it for our elm site at cobb county um, this is a kind of an interactive link. Uh, if you pull it up, um, it kind of talks about how we use it at Cobb County. For mainly for us, it's just on the trail system for emergency responders and interacts with our 911 system. But this is just a, a website that we have out for our public that they can use. I put again, I put it in the chat. So we really haven't done a whole lot with it as far as using it within a census format. Um, we do use the grid in both, we use Esri products for GIS. So anything that we use it for, we use in Esri and we pull in the national grid as the background for that, for mapping. Again, Jesse Glasgow is on the call. He is our main consultant that helps us with this, but we do use also a navigator app which is an Esri product for our field teams that can access the national grid as well as part of kind of the base map for it, if that helps at all. Um, I'm just trying are to think. There, are there any uh, services currently within your organization that utilize census data? Um, yeah, so for census data, that's just for um, national grid stuff. For a census data, we do use it heavily. If you don't know about Cobb County, we're part of Metro Atlanta. Uh, we're a population of about 800,000 people. Uh, and it's growing tremendously. So uh, a lot of things that we're starting to do now, we've always used census data for comp plan, long range planning, um, you know, basic conversations about 
how the growth or businesses and, and things that we need to do provide services to our community you know where are the homeless where are the pockets of unemployed versus you know single families and things like that so as a county we would use that information just using census block data to look at it to navigate and customize the services that we will provide for you and a big example of that would be like our senior services we do this a lot um, we can use the census data to find the average age within a block and if there's a high level of seniors then we do things like market our senior centers to them um, also seniors have a high incident of fall rate like falling in their house or breaking hips and things so we will do education and outreach to our public safety teams um, maybe more so dedicated at our service centers in those areas to address those people. So we've used it in the past for more things like, like that, if that makes sense. Um, you know, we don't really mark, we have an economic development team, but as a county, we don't necessarily market ourselves. You know, we're not a marketing business. Our Planning department, though, does use that kind of data, household income, education levels to look at the parameters of the county on maybe where to build things or how to plan out the county. Now, as we move forward, census data for us, uh, one of the big initiatives coming up is um, DE&I, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Initiatives. I'm not sure if everybody kind of calls it that, but we call it the DE&I. So expanding that use of the census data for different purposes. Looking at, um, we call them low opportunity zones. So it's not based on necessarily race or income, but it's a whole myriad of factors that goes into an analysis of about 20 different things that give us an outcome of what we define as a low opportunity zone. So what that means is maybe somebody that doesn't have access to ride chair, or um, maybe they're in a food desert, you know, they don't have access to a grocery store within a certain distance of their home or public transportation. So we look at those and we call them low opportunity zones. So that's one of our biggest initiatives moving forward. That's fairly new for us is the whole DE&I thing, but that's a big, big thing moving forward. And that's, and I just say it's, it's an initiative of our management team. However, we are in the South in a very divided county in a very divided state. So we do get pushback um, on trying to get that funded and moving. However, behind the scenes using census data and things like that, we can look at areas that maybe we need to put more street lights in, right? If they're high crime areas um, with low income neighborhoods, is that a cause of more crimes? Um, different type of roads, you can pull in all kinds of data for that. So, but we use strictly the census data by the block format. We have not looked at it as far as using it in a gridded format with national grid, but I don't know why we, we couldn't, um, if that helps at all. Yeah, uh, no, this, this definitely does. And so there, okay. there may even be benefit, uh, just for the sake of spatial continuity, when you're trying to do an analysis or just geographically look, all right, where where do we want to place street lights or what are the different characteristics that make up a potentially vulnerable neighborhood? Right. Um, that there can be huge difference in just the geographic size of those census blocks where yeah. you know you could have just an enormous region out over one location and then just a really, really tiny tiny census block that's a true city block uh, yeah. elsewhere. I, I completely agree. It's like whenever we got the COVID data, they would give it to us by zip codes. It was useless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> zip code is right. such a big area. Um, no, I agree. And it's just, um, but if you, and I could go on for a while and talk about this, but if you want to speak like offline or separately and have a separate discussion, I'm happy to do that with you too and put you in touch with some of the people in our planning department that use that data in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. I use it again every once in a while for some of the bigger projects like the equity, but we do have some of our staff in different departments that use it weekly at least um, whenever they're discussing planning or zoning or new developments and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you Bonus, you have a couple of comments just so you're, you're aware of it. 
Uh, Jennifer, uh, somebody indicated that they couldn't get the Cobb County link to work. Just here, where? Oh, uh, did I not put it in right? Let me see. So, oh, you got HTTPS. That's why. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. So this is Jules. Can I interrupt for just a minute? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This uh, this discussion that's just taken place kind of highlights one of the issues that that I think exists uh, when we, particularly for the new folks that are involved and in, when you contemplate, and I see the, the chat comment that uh, from Cook County that says uh, uh, interest uh, is in the Department of Ur Emergency Management and Response and the census data they must use are things like daytime population versus resident population. Well, I don't know exactly what that means other than to me, it says that uh, the utility of the U.S. national grid uh, really, uh, and why it's confusing maybe to a lot of folks is it depends on the scale of your interest. If your interest is in doing sort of uh, large scale analyses of population trends or, or areas of, uh, you know, uh, interest for different situations, uh, city block size or larger. Uh, well, yeah, the the grid has been adapted and and used in that. But uh, when we first conceived it and and put it put it together, equating it with the military grid reference system back in the day, uh, it was a much more focused interest in terms of let's say emergency response uh, and uh, and uh, incident response and incident location and, and things like that, which are at a very tiny scale physically. Uh, I think the geographers will call that large scale. I'm not sure, but, but uh, and that's what made the U S national grid so useful was it was a consistent way to represent very, uh, localized points of interest so that uh, response teams could find them even if they weren't on uh, what's, you know, classical street maps or or things uh, like, the, and just like the military does in, in responding to uh, situations away from, you know, normal, uh, I mean, in rural and, uh, and uh, remote areas. Uh, where there aren't any uh, local uh, street maps and things like that. So mm -hmm. it really depends on, the, like I say, the scale of your interest, but uh, but the grid is uh, enormously useful for, for those uh, emergency response kind of situations, uh, and particularly the ELMs. And uh, I, by the way, I just sent the... Uh, the draft uh, ELM brochure to some folks in in DHS and uh, Department of Transportation to try to stimulate some interest uh, in their in the highway use and 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 all of that. So uh, I don't know. I'm kind of rambling, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, but but it, there really is a, a confusion factor. It seems when we try to to consider the breadth of how the grid can be used uh, uh, in in a whole variety of different uh, applications from from large scale uh, data analyses down to the smallest scale of uh, finding a specific fire hydrant in a in a specific part of the city that may be wiped out by a hurricane or something and so no other references are available so over i'll stop uh, there well i think e even within the realm of, of emergency services there's a, a huge value to be said uh even for some of those poorly covered areas right uh of being able to pull census data about the specific population or location that you're headed to uh in a very short form way that doesn't require any sort of guesswork interpolation from other weird census geographies or anything like that uh that there could still be huge value to um just the accessibility of of more information um, that currently takes a little bit of a little bit of work to get to. <laughs> right. Yes. So, Fennis, you've got some additional comments that came in. I, I'm not trying to steer your conversation here, but just so you're aware of it, you've got some additional chat comments. 
and I've saved the chat. So if you want to do follow up Absolutely. later, um, you, we'll have the links for you. We may we may have to here. Uh, but looking at uh, your comment here, David, uh, with Cook County, um, you're looking at things like daytime population versus resident population. So is the source of that data census uh, for y'all? Yes, you can find that in census data. I don't mean to answer for you, but yeah, we use that too in Cobb. It helps us to look at because we're um, part of Metro Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So we have, and it's changed a lot since COVID as well. Um, how many people come into our county to work versus how many kind of drive to the city. Uh, we also have the Atlanta Braves baseball stadium is in our county. So that um, is kind of like a pop-up city. 80 sometimes a year that comes into play so it does affect us whenever we look at emergency response you know on those particular days even for staffing 911 fire police um you know our transportation center things like that so it is actually part of census data and we use that too david as part of our stuff it's really interesting if you haven't looked at it before yeah, so then, okay, all right. <laughs> so for the current application then of uh, the daytime versus resident population information, I assume that, uh, would that be in the US National Grid format? Like, is there a conversion that's currently happening there? Not that I know of, I know that it's all, it is through census, so it's based on the census boundaries. Okay, okay. And then let's see, we have another comment here from BJ. Um, do, 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 development of a damage assessment app using the US National Grid with Esri Survey 123 to comply with FEMA damage assessment guidance. Uh, our plan uses census data uh, to divide uh, areas by population for rapid assessment. So this is a good example then of a. Uh, <laughs> Uh, of an instance where a conversion is definitely happening somewhere along the way from census data to one thing or another. Uh, BJ, are you able to share a little bit more about the maybe the methodology or how they're arriving at that? Uh, hi, Fennis, can you hear me? Yeah. So I, I can't answer your question because I get that information from uh, our GIS department. I'm not in the GIS department. I'm, I was the emergency manager at the time, so I helped write the plan. Uh, but I got the data from them, so I don't know how they converted it. Okay, but it's still it's still good to know that I think it sounds like there has to be some sort of a conversion happening there, um, and and usually that means that there's some sort of some level of error that you have to be able to embrace, uh, especially if that population is being allocated from a finite census resolution uh, for 2020 or later, uh, with that differential privacy component we can end up with some really wild estimates that aren't yep, always- understood. I also, uh, not being a GIS person, I also just counted houses, you know? <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> uh, that is one of the beautiful things about the current census loadout though. There's no differential privacy enacted on housing unit counts. Um, however, it is enacted on housing types, very sadly. Um, and Georgiana has also thrown a link in chat here uh, to the Florida State University uh, website with various U.S. National Grid implementations. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I'll definitely reference that as we're uh, going through here, writing this up. I know we are nearing the end of our time here, but I do want to um, reinforce that I am reachable via the email at the bottom of the screen there at fennis.read at doff.ca.gov. Um, so if you have other things after the fact that you think of that you would like to be included in this write-up, uh, please feel free to shoot me a message. Um, and with that, are there any other closing thoughts anyone would like to, to offer? <laughs> Venice, I think, you know, kind of the, the, the heart of the matter here is just um, in in reflecting on what Jennifer was talking about in that the COVID world, um, the level of data 
that was used both by the CDC and what the Bureau was able to provide didn't give the level of granularity that if you're trying to do some level of control as to where uh, something is breaking out, you're going to need a better level of data. And that probably that thought, I'm just throwing this out here, kind of spreads across all these ranges of things from damage assessment to, you know, the trail rescue scenario to the work that Georgiana did down at the Fl uh, Florida State University. So that would be my sort of like final steering thought on it. And, I, you know, if there's more comments here. We can leave the discussion going um, if there are more folks that want to contribute some other thoughts. I'm good. I have to log off. I've got another meeting, but if you guys need anything, just feel free to contact me. For sure. Thank you for your input today, Jennifer. Sure, absolutely. Thanks. What do you think, Venice? I think already this this is a healthy amount of stuff for me to, to okay. work with. So okay. I think I'm fine calling it there. Folks have my contact if they want to add more. Okay. All right. Well, in that case. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we got a couple more slides here to close things out, and we'll be on our way. So next meeting, big fat reminder, uh, is Wednesday, April 24th. I know flowers will be up and uh, cherry blossoms in Washington, D.C., all that good stuff. Uh, 2 p.m. Central Time. Um, and then until we meet again, success comes before work only in the dictionary. So just carry that forward. Thank you for your time, everybody. Really appreciate it. And y'all have a great weekend. And with that, I gavel a thing closed.